Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of SEO's Getting Coffee. Thank you very much for joining us. And this week we have a very, very, very special guest. It's Iseline Mulehauser. And thank you very much, Iseline, for joining us today. Um, how are you doing? Thank you for having me. I'm great. I'm a little stressed out to be the guest today, but also <laughs> really excited to answer questions. So <laughs> thank you for having me. No, oh, thank you very much for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. And Amina, how are you doing this morning? Yeah, I'm good. I'm ready with my uh, mug. I have a fishing one today. I love fishing. Oh, so. good, good. I've very got on um, brand. I've got a cup of tea here, so I'm a, I'm, a, I'm on the tea today, not the coffee. Same. <laughs> I'm on tea today. <laughs> Good. Well, thank you very much again for joining us for a coffee, cup of tea. Um, so I think the, the best thing to do straight away uh, is, Lynn, is just get a, get an introduction from yourself about yourself and your um, experience and career in the industry. And yeah, if you could just introduce yourself for, 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 for us and also for the, for the guests and everybody that's listening, that'd be great. So I'm based in Switzerland. I speak French initially. And since Switzerland is a multilingual country, from day one, I have worked with multilingual websites, first as a digital marketer and then as an SEO. So this is really a topic like I've been handling forever. <laughs> and it seems like it's part of every, our everyday languages here because, I mean, my box of several has several languages. So it, it we don't even realize that it's there. But then when I've joined Women in Tech SEO, I've realized that multilingual SEO is a thing for other people. So I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is my niche. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think, yeah, that would, that's it. I think, and today's theme, I think we're going to be asking you, you know, a variety of questions around, you know, multilingual SEO. And hopefully that will give some insight to people and, and, and the people that are listening as well, who, who do need some help and advice um, in, you know, in any and all things multilingual SEO, basically. Um, I think Amina's got a question that's probably good to start off with. So I'll hand over to yeah. Amina and then we'll just do some back and forth and, and then we'll see, uh, yeah, we'll see what we get to. And then of course, any opportunity for you to ask us questions and have a discussion as well. That'd be great. Cool. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned it here, you know, you kind of found when you joined women in technical SEO, you found your like tribe, the multilingual SEO tribe uh, as well. But I know that some people are confused between international SEO and multilingual SEO. Are they the same? What is the differences? How do they fit together? What's, what's your opinion on that? So they are like, I would say two, sign of probably, two sides of probably the same coin. It means that they might go together, but also they might not. In the sense that in Switzerland, multilingual SEO is not international SEO because it is all for the same country. Um, as well, you could have translations of, of your website. Let's say you are targeting the U.S. markets. You might have a translation in Spanish, but to target the Spanish people within the USA. So that would be multilingual. And then international, it could be that you're targeting the U.S. market and the Australian market and the U.K. market. Is that yeah. multilingual? Mm, I don't know. Could be that you have only one version of your website. Yeah. But then you have layers on top of other layers. So you could target, let's say, you Spanish, yeah, like you're targeting the Spanish Spain uh, markets and you have a Catalan version of your website, but you're also targeting the South um <clears throat> South American market. So you might yeah, have Latin, other yeah. version of your website, maybe a Chilean web like version of the website so you you can really have layers and you can as a website owner you could decide to have only one type of spanish and try to go for several markets for instance or you can have several types of spanish so those are really choices that needs to be made by the business owners because if you decide to have several version of your website you will need to put the effort into the content mm. and this is where multilingual seo comes into the picture because then it means that you have several spanish which are different languages for different markets and this is it could be considered multilingual so really it's about layers what you're trying to do yeah. and how 
friendly you want to be with your market i would say hmm. yeah should a um it's a, it's a good uh track actually it's a question it's like so you've got a business that's approaching um you know tran translation or thinking about you know uh, a multilingual should they simply translate their website and if they shouldn't simply just translate their website why should they not just translate it <laughs> it depends i would say <laughs> translating is always a good first step so in switzerland we have the the thing we have three languages but the thing is these are really expensive the swiss market is very expensive also for european brands who wants to enter the swiss markets because it's small it's like rich yeah we spend yeah. a lot you can have higher prices but it's small which means that you have less people and you have the same type of investment for a pool of people that is small limited, basically yeah. so it's you limited, have yeah. you have swiss french is much smaller than france french like in mm -hmm. terms of side like size of markets so i would say like translations are a good first step because realistically you are not going to localize every pages of your website. I mean, we mm -hmm. all want that. <laughs> it never happens. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. translations are a good first step. Usually what I say to my clients, like, find out, let's prioritize the pages. Some of them, we are going to do it automatic. Yes. Some of them, we're going to translate them. But that's few of them. We usually jump. I would say it's preferable to jump often from automatic to localization because translation is a sort of human translation is sort of middle ground that mm. can be useful for terms of um, conditions law type of things but otherwise mm -hmm. just jump to localization so i would say you could just translate it and that's an excellent first step but mm -hmm. then as an seo you we need to manage the expectations of our stakeholders because they think, oh, translation is, ex is expensive, but then I don't get the results. So we need to be yeah. careful with that when we say, oh, let's translate it just to have, you know, the stakeholders on the same, like with the same level of knowledge as us. Otherwise they have bad surprises like, oh, we yeah. spent that much and we have this much. Yeah, and you mentioned one of the things which which does happen sometimes, and why people are can be a little bit scared of localization uh, as such is the cost. It's the ramping up cost that can happen by translating, particularly if you're doing it with a human rather than an AI, and then taking it a step further into localization, which is again another you know there's research and stuff that you need to do to be able to localize properly. So what are some of you, how would you scale it? How do your clients kind of manage that budget side of things? So usually what we do is really, we, we with my biggest clients, we have uh, three lights for the text. So we have a red light, an orange light and a green light. Yeah. Uh, red light is like automatic and we're like, okay, we just, you know, like, for instance, some of like um, experiences from people within a place, we just translate it automatically because it, it's like, it doesn't really make, it's good to have them, but it, it's not going to make a lot of sense. So that's the type of content. I mean, don't waste too much time. If it's too relevant to a place, don't waste too much time, like use automatic. And other type of content, we have green lights, which is localization, which is a type of content we have identified. There is a high search volume for the, like, for the Swiss French, and we like all in localization. Mm. Orange light is um, human translations, but we actually stopped using it because oh, wow. we realized that it's still rather expensive but it doesn't bring results in terms of seo because translators they don't take liberties with the text so they don't understand that like they don't understand seo optimization and such mm. so we at the moment we really go between like red light just automatic and green light just full localization and 
so that's how we balance the budget and we say okay and and we know that it takes longer so they know they have first results in german and then results come in french and it's okay with the management yeah that's interesting and one of the things that you were saying here which kind of comes to the fore is this seo element of it um and at verushka on uh, um the technical women in technical seo was talking about uh language-based search intent which for me that was super interesting and that's kind of the missing piece sometimes the seo missing piece because we had a client who was looking looking into localization and we did a whole piece of keyword research to understand actually do you even need to translate some of those terms or is the actual volume in English? So you ended up having this website where, you know, you kind of had to take this into consideration. Yeah, a really good, really good example of that was like a, a, an engineering client where it's, you know, it's based. So like they get a lot of obviously uh, traffic and a lot of searches and, and, and a lot of their kind of clients come from, say, Germany. But in Germany, actually, a lot of the engineering terms were being searched for in, in in english you know so there wasn't actually in existence that language in german um and if it was going to be in existence in german then it would actually be something that nobody would actually say anyway so i think it kind of you know that priority system that you were explaining with like kind of like that traffic light system is, yeah. you know i think it's really important but it's also really interesting about that point about you know you can you know, it's, it is about the translator as well. And the person that's actually doing the translation is like you were saying about them having that kind of, I guess it's like copywriting, isn't it? And I think um, in some of the, you know, some of uh, your you know material and the things that you've mentioned before is that it's like, instead of, you know, the translation is actually thinking about it as copywriting as well, because you're, you know, you're producing a, a page and you're producing it for that particular area. Right. So. Exactly. Like one of the main difference we have between um, German and French is like the Swiss Germans, they like to explain lots of things before giving a summary. So, and us in French, we like having the summary to the point and then we would go first, da, 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 second, da, 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 and explain things. So most of the time I just reorganize the contents because yeah. you would lose your audience not giving the summary at the top of yeah. of your text because we'd be bored. We'd be like, what's the point of this yeah. text? It's too long. I'm jumping to somewhere else. So, and yeah. this is typically something translators would not do because also mm. their job is to be accurate. And yeah. as a copywriter, my job is not to provide an accurate translation, but to gather to the needs of the audience which is mm. yeah, very different intent yeah. yeah yeah and um that kind of like emphasizes this other side of localization which is the market research and kind of understanding you know the 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 intent and understanding the culture that somebody comes from uh, that your audience comes from how do you approach it i mean where what's what can companies do to get started with actual localization rather than translation well you need to hire someone who comes from the place and who just who who at least if that person doesn't come from the place has this cultural awareness for some reason because that person moved married someone i don't know but you know someone who has the cultural awareness to understand the difference in how we want the content organized, for instance, or what is going to sound bad because some things just sound really boring when translated. Yeah. And so really the best, I think, I know that it's not easy, but the best is really to hire a freelancer or consultant as sort of an external part of a team like that person is not in your team, like internally hired, but it's sort of an external part of the team. And you would, you know, after a year, you, you get better. And as a company, you have return on investment. So I think you have to invest in someone at the beginning and try to find someone who's okay to commit for long term. Because after a while, I see that with my clients after three, four years, it, Everything goes so fast now. 
Like, mm. because we've tested what works and what doesn't. And I know what I can skip. And the level of trust is there that I just do the text and use the hours and send my time sheet and, you know, and then it's easy. However, I understand that it's more complicated. It sounds more complicated, but at the end of the day, the results are really better. So it's really a perspective yeah. on long versus short term. And I would say that's why the prioritization is so important because you could say, I'm trying out. Let's just translate everything with a machine and then step by step, make it better. And something we have seen in Switzerland that works well is, um, you have the name of the writer and the name of the either machine, translator, or copywriter. So it means that at the top of the article next to the date of publication, you know as a user, oh, this is machine translated. This mm. is not. My expectation and manage. And usually for my clients, we add a sentence. These pages has been automatically translated. Um, we are working on making our content better. Here's an email address. You can contact us if you don't get it or if you mm. need more, which means that you do it in a very in intentional way and you still show the users that you are there for them as a brand, you know? Yeah. So it helps to, it does help to build that kind of transparency with the brand, doesn't it? And, yeah. and you know, and, and give that kind of, you know, that trust to the user that you actually, you know, you're, you're doing this for the purpose of being, because, you know, it can be easily exploited, can't it, with like AI these days is that you can just, you know, run scripts or you can run what, and you can translate websites in, you know, and you can get hundreds, if not thousands of pages sorted. But that's obviously exploiting that that technology, whereas actually that doesn't that doesn't have the user and the, the searcher and, and your customer in mind. You know, that doesn't give them, you know, it's not you're not putting them as the priority. And, and that's the truth is that if you can have that, transparency with with your potential customers with the, with the readers of your website of your content then it gives them that trust that actually you are kind of you know producing content for them and you're putting their needs and their requirements first which i think goes a long way in terms of building that kind of brand and business authority especially like in in today you know in today's uh, market yeah so that's how it should be done how is it usually done? What have you seen out there in the world of, you know, multilingual uh, SEO where you were like, oh, yeah, a bit of a fail there so that we know what to avoid? So one thing I can see on the Swiss French market, and I expect it, it could be similar on other markets, which have like on the Spanish different countries market, is that it's cheaper to have people from not from Switzerland working on the content. But the thing is, the French is like France French and Swiss French are different type of French. We talk to people differently. I mean, we understand each other, but you feel it. So, you know, and one of the biggest issue that makes for search engines is that I have seen websites Swiss German websites who are trying to target the Swiss French because that's the market, the national market, but they're ranking in France because the way they speak and the words they use, it's yeah. not what we use here. So, and, and this is where the management is then surprised because they, they have not been like nobody managed the expectation saying, okay, you, we can do this. It's like the short term solution. But so they come to me like, what happens? We spend so much doing SEO. And I'm like, but this is not the word we use, like just literally. <laughs> and as you mentioned, Sean, for your clients in Germany, typically in Swiss French and Swiss German, we, we are not afraid of what is called anglicism, which yeah. means using English words. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In in Swiss French, we use German words, we use English words, we don't care. But in Canadian French and France French, they are going to translate those words. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, you're ranking on, on <clears throat> other markets. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Uh, this probably a good just to segue onto um, keyword research tools. We always like to ask like favorite tools, um, and for uh, obviously you know for like multilingual SEO in mind, of course. Like, what are your kind of favorite and most go to tools that you use for say keyword research? I use href. Um, oh, controversial. For... I know. <laughs> yeah. But the, but the thing is, so for one of my clients, I had to use Mongo tools. And the thing oh. is with Mongo tool, for instance, I don't know if you've noticed, but if the, the search volume is low, you have to click on it to make it visible. Mm. So for small markets, it means that you spend ages a lot of time. Mm. manually <laughs> clicking on the words just to make the search volume and the keyword difficulty upper. And that was a nightmare. And I was like, you want me to do that? I have done it, yeah. but it cost that much. And so that's why I use href because href shows like it shows you the volume without you doing any type of manual activity. And mm. it also show you when it's between zero and 10, which means on a small market that the word is identified at least. So sometimes it tells you it's not in our database and sometimes it shows you zero to 10 without manual action. So that's yeah. why I use it because like I can't have manual actions, single manual actions because it's a small um, search volume. So mm. SEMrush might be fine. I don't know. I have not used it, but at least I know that Mongo tools is not like it's not working yeah. for niche. Yeah. No, it's a, it wasn't my favorite. I've tested it when I was looking at uh, for, for an article that I, I did. Uh, yeah, it wasn't my favorite. It's it's all right. But as you say, it's yeah, there's a couple uh, with all of them. It's like that. Ahref has its own. Yeah. So hmm. and it's here also forever. <laughs> the indication of global volume that you can find also, I think in SEMrush, you also have the global volume. Like yeah. it also tells you an alternative indication of like, OK, in this market, this word is not big, but generally speaking, that's an important word. So, yeah, yeah so that's a good tool. And otherwise, I would say, at least for Switzerland, any any practice that is good for niche topic would be good because it's it's just niche because there are less people, you know. Hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, just to wrap up on this on this, then I mean that I guess the it would be great to kind of get like an overview like when should a business or brand actually think about implementing a multilingual seo strategy if you can think of like you know a couple of points that you could share if they want to st like to open up to a new market obviously like you need like you need to translate your content if you want to target a new market however i would add do proper, um, how do you say, um, business research, like sort of mm -hmm. business analyst type of research, like SEO is good, but just make sure that the, the size of the market it's and the size it. of your inventory and crossing the borders, because lots of um, e-commerce try to do that more than services I have seen. So make sure that, because you can have additional costs, like, yeah borders, delivery, whatever, that makes it crazy for customer service mm -hmm. after you have translated your website. So I would say don't rush into translating, but really like think about the strategy. Like, is it is it really going to be cost effective? Like, can you expect a good return on investment and how long is it going to take? So... Yeah, no rushing, you know, <laughs> go yeah, as yeah. slow as necessary, as we say <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, that moves us on to uh, room 404. So each episode, we will banish something that has uh, annoyed us um, into room 404, never to return LRC the light of day again. Um, we would like to invite you, Isaline, to... Um, yeah, basically ask you on something that you'd like to banish to room 404. Has anything, and can you think of anything that might have annoyed you this week or maybe over the past month? 
So at the moment, I would like to banish from WhoCommerce the fact that WhoCommerce adds a URL for every <laughs> attribute. <laughs> and and oh. I would I would like so much to banish business owners to think adding attributes and subcategories is good because it's not it just adds complexity and I don't want 150 attributes for 40 <laughs> products please <laughs> brilliant yeah so, thank yeah. you that can that can yeah safely go in there and be locked away oh, and God, we will yeah. th- and we will throw the key away and it can stay there we yeah, agree absolutely. we agree with that one <laughs> that one is definitely I'm surprised it's not in there already Sean it should have been <laughs> true true uh, but well, usually we had our we had our GA four um, couple of weeks really when it was every week I think GA four was going in over and over again uh, behind yeah. each it was like further and further into the back of the room four at four as it gets locked away. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Um, are there any uh, anything for any final things from from you, Amin, or any final questions? No, I mean it's it's been amazing having you. I know you also have a podcast, so tell us a little bit about your podcast so that we can, uh, you know, start following as well. Yeah, so I host uh, meetups that are called SEO Nerd Switzerland, on both online and in person. And my post- podcast is is called Working SEO, and I have a French speaking podcast for people who want to start their own business. Oh, great. Also, Fantastic. and if you are interested, like if listeners want to follow up on um, anything that's related to culture and language, they should really follow Verusca Anconitano. She shares very valuable long form articles. And yeah, I love anything she writes. So if that topic is interesting for you, do follow it. And for international SEO, I'd recommend following Tori Gray from Gray Dots Company. She also shares long form articles that are great references. And both women in technical SEO. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Excellent. Thank no, you. Great. Well, um, we will put all of your details, Isaline, in the description. Um, and, you know, please, anybody that is watching a list, please, please do um, connect with Isaline online and, you know, of course, ask any questions. And perhaps, especially if you need any help with uh, multilingual SEO as well, she's she's the person to go to. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you for coming on, sharing a coffee with us. I've finished my tea. Um, and at that point, we will say goodbye to everyone and we will see you next time. Thank you, everybody, and goodbye. Bye. Thank you.